All right. So like I said, we are going to be focusing in Asia with our talks of pollution just because it makes the most sense that there are the most polluted cities in the world located in that area, basically between India and China. Excuse me. Um, so like I said, we're going to be talking about two different types of pollution throughout our exploration over the next couple of days. And those two different types are water and air pollution. Okay. Um, today's talkings are going to be focused specifically in India, and I'll show you why, or you'll see why basically throughout the next couple of slides. But when we talk about pollution, we need to talk about air and water pollution. So those are the two most common, uh, and those are the two basically most out of control across the world. All right, so let's talk about air first. Uh, so when we're talking about air pollution, um, the reason that we are operating, like I said, where we are is because 11 out of the 12 most polluted cities on earth are in India based on a 2018 uh, consensus or a 2018 research. The number one most polluted city on earth is uh, Kampur, India, which has a population of 3 million people. I only tell you the population because it'll make uh, a difference later when we talk about the causes. Uh, when we're talking about air pollution, there's different specifications on what is considered pollution versus what is considered debris versus what is considered just like normal everyday stuff, okay? You are more than welcome to um, condense that second pair or that second uh, bullet point, basically, okay? That is just a definition from the WHO or the uh, World Health Organization that says that uh, air pollution uh, can be classified in two ways, one of which is 2.5 and the other is 10. 2.5 are particles smaller than 2.5 microns in diameter, and uh, 10 are particles that are 10 microns in diameter or bigger, okay? The smaller 2.5 particles uh, from sources like open flames and diesel exhaust can linger in the air longer and penetrate deeper into the lungs than larger particles, which is why they're a bigger concern for health officials and, high, and a high priority target for reduction. So I'm going to give you an example of basically the difference between like a 10 micron and a 2.5, okay? Um, let's say you're walking on the street and um, you uh, happen to see one of those like cottontail fuzzies, uh, like the little uh, white fuzzies that look like a germ basically floating around. Uh, and it gets really close to your mouth and you don't want to ingest it or you don't want to inhale it or anything, so you just swat it away, right? That's an example of something that's a 10 micron piece of debris or piece of something, right? Um, you can easily get it out of your way, right? You're easily not going to ingest it. It's not going to go in your body because you have a barrier, you have a blocking um, that can help you not eat it, basically, right? Versus at the same time, or after you've kind of swatted away that little fuzzy, okay? Um, oh, somebody, I don't know, it was a big truck. <laughs> somebody drives by in a big truck, and releases a bunch of diesel fumes or diesel exhaust, okay? And uh, you can't really get away from that, right? You inhale it as they go by, right? Diesel ex exhaust or exhaust fumes in general, doesn't have to be diesel, it could be gas, whatever, um, are 2.5 particles. There's no way that you can stop it from coming in your body versus just not breathing, okay? And you need to breathe, so there's nothing you can do, okay? So 10 microns are things that you can physically like get out of your way, like a little fuzzy or something that you, uh, you know, can uh, not let enter your body versus 2.5s like exhaust fumes or other things that you literally cannot see that the only way to stop it is if you didn't breathe, okay? That's why the 2.5s are a bigger concern for health officials and a high priority target because it's things that you can't avoid.
Okay. So, all right, so to begin talking about air pollution, I wanted to show you guys a video to start us off of basically um, some of the reasons or some of the uh, whys uh, as to why air pollution in India is so bad. So I just ask you guys to follow along with this. It's basically an investigation as to why air pollution is so bad and what India is trying to do about it to help the cause. Our special Earth Matters coverage takes us to one of the most dangerous places on the planet for air pollution. Come on, there we go. In India, nearly 1.8 million people die every year as a result of dirty air. World Health Organization says 9 out of 10 people across the globe live in places where the air quality is poor. Before she went to Sri Lanka, Elizabeth Palmer spent a week in India's capital, New Delhi, to see the human toll. Delhi is tense, with Jews in both lungs fighting tuberculosis. Which I heard there was a lot of respiratory distress. Yeah. He was uh, having difficulty with breathing. He's still here. And so is every patient in the emergency ward of Delhi's National Institute for TB and Respiratory Diseases. All of them, one way or another, are victims of Delhi's filthy hands. Every day, between 800 and 1,000 people with lung problems lie on the floors in Delhi. Dr. Arvind Kumar is a prominent chest surgeon and founder of the Lung Care Foundation. Everybody living in India dies. He means just from breathing air. At its worst, it can be seven times dirtier than the World Health Organization considers safe. In Delhi, a booming city of 19 million, a thousand extra cars hit the road every day, contributing to murk that's dangerous for many. But the real cost of this pollution is huge. So, brain attack, brain development, poor, heart attack, hypertension, birth defects. Politicians had no choice. They had to at least try to go green. If you need a taxi in New Delhi, you get it for one of these. But with 100,000 rickshaws spewing pollution into the air, the government has to do something. So it started out by banning the gasoline-powered ones. Now the natural gas ones are being phased out because the future is electric. And it's being built here at Shri Gandhi Lloyd's rickshaw factory on the Delhi's outskirts. Not very high tech, maybe, but these vehicles are zero emission. Shishir Agrawal, the managing director, headed the shift to electric models three years ago. So the writing's on the wall. India is going electric. It is inevitable. Gentlemen, pay attention. Already, the e-rickshaws are in play. They're cheaper to run, they can be recharged by the driver at home, and the government is about to subsidize the cost of the batteries. That's because India can't clean up unless everyone even the coolest can be good to join the environment. Take traditional cooking fires in the slums. They send fine particles of burning wood, garbage, even dung, deep into the lungs. Smoke is a huge part of Delhi's air problem. And while cooking fires like this may nourish a family, at the same time, it makes everybody's health that much worse. So the government is subsidizing an alternative. Clean burning natural gas stoves at a price almost everyone can manage. Air is needed for every breath. The only thing you can do if you want to avoid total damage is to stop breathing, which unfortunately we cannot do for more than a minute. Hi, how are you? There is some hope. Peak pollution levels in New Delhi seem to have leveled off. So now the urgent challenge is to actually bring them down. For CBS This Morning, I'm Elizabeth Palmer in New Delhi. I mean, that was alarming to hear from that doctor. A lot of work. Yeah. yeah. Look how we complain here when you see the slightest bit of smog. Stuff we just take for granted in this country. 
it, it shows you what other people are doing. Like you think the future is electric car and everything. Really interesting. Okay, <clears throat> so. I'd like to point out that I really like this video because the doctor is so sassy. <laughs> it's like the only way you can get rid of it is by not breathing and we can't do that. <laughs> so that video, like I said, highlighted some of the just some of the things um, that is not only leading, excuse me, leading to um, the uh, high levels of pollution throughout India, but also some of the things that the government is trying to do to repeal that or to get things back to a normal level so that their people are healthier. But a really important part of this that I want you guys to recognize is when they said that, um, you know, if they're going to do this, they have to get everybody in. It has to be an all in situation because if the poorer parts of the country can't participate, then it's not going to do any health versus just the richer parts of the country. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So a couple of things I'd like you to look at are a couple of graphs I'd like you to look at that basically talk about the fact that population density is a huge factor when it comes to pollution. Okay. Those areas in that dark purple color or even that dark reddish color, excuse me, are the areas that have the most people as well as the most pollution. Okay. So the one on your, your left, okay. Um, the one on your left is talking about the quality of air uh, when it comes to uh, versus basically good to hazardous being like toxic for you. So the places where there's the most people, it unfortunately is the place where it's very, un, excuse me, very unhealthy or very hazardous, okay? On the flip side, this one here on the right is also showing that it's not just a problem in India, but also a problem in China and other Asian countries where their population density is very high. When there's a large amount of people in a very small space, even in India and in, or in China, like near Beijing, um, that's what's going to cause the most pollution. The more people, the more pollution you have. It's just, a, you know, science, basically, okay? Um, in terms of population effective, the WHO has estimated that 99.3% of India's air quality is above the safe limit, meaning that it is unsafe, okay? 99.3% of all of the air, or the air quality in all of India is above the WHO's safe limit versus 98.7 in China, okay? So, the air quality just has declined exponentially over the years. Okay, so how did it get there? How does? Why is it so bad? How is it so bad? Okay. First and foremost, so the biggest thing that's going to be a contributor into um, the worsening conditions of air pollution across the country of India and across the world is traffic exhaust. Okay. Those cars that are running natural gas or diesel, whatever it may be, are giving off exhaust that gets filtered into the air because it is a 2.5 micron. Those things are very, very hard to um, get rid of. Like once a uh, air quality has been decreased to a certain amount, it's very, very hard to get back to a good quality. And like we just said, the more population they have, the more, uh, most likely the more, excuse me, cars you have on the road, which means more pollution. Number two, or another factor is gonna be factory emissions. India has a really growing industrial base when it comes to manufacturing. And those factories that make all of those products uh, have emissions of their own. Smoke, uh, gas, uh, other waste products that get filtered out into the air or other chemicals that get vaporized into the air. Factories put off all of those things or kind of have a part in, um, in releasing all of those things into the air. Uh, along with that, because again, uh, India is growing and the population is kind of out of control at this point, there's also construction dust and other things that are needed to like build a city or build a community. Um, cooking and heating are going to be a major one, especially in the rural areas of India or any rural area of Asia, basically, that the rural parts of the area, the poorest people in the country don't have enough money or don't have the option of electric burners or electric uh, or even natural gas stoves. So they're literally just having to burn things out in the open with wood uh, or like a wood burning stove, a wood fire, et cetera, et cetera. And it takes off into the air. And then last but not least, we see this sometimes in Asia, but a lot in the Middle East as well, is burning crop. Sorry, I got a piece of gum. Um, burning crop is a natural part of like the agricultural cycle. We kind of know that living here in Iowa that every once in a while you just got to burn off the leaves or you got to burn off the, the brush basically. 
to get ready for a new cycle. Um, but we've managed it or we're able to manage it in a way that's safe, not only for the crops around it, but also for the environment and for the air, right? Um, countries who are largely producing agriculturally like India and other places in um, uh, Asia and the Middle East uh, haven't quite gotten that down and they're doing it more often than we would in here in the United States. So burning crop is actually an, another way that we are putting more things into the air or participating in air pollution. Okay? So basically the question to ask is, you know, all this stuff is happening, traffic exhaust, factory emissions, cooking, heating, burning, all that fun stuff. You might be thinking to yourself, well, we can't help those things. Like everybody has cars, factories still got to run. We have to cook, we have to burn crop. Like what's the problem? What do we have to do then? Okay. The reason that it's so bad for India or why we really need to pay attention to India is because they have less space than us and almost double the people which means all of that stuff is doubled and it's leading to 2.5 million deaths a year due to pollution, especially air pollution. Okay. So we've got India and China that are very clearly at the top of the leaderboards. And even the USA is still there, but it's over, or it's under, or way under what is being produced in India. Okay. All right, so what are the, I think that's where I'm going with it next. What are the consequences then, okay? If we cannot um, get air pollution under control or if India cannot find a solution to better their air quality, what are the consequences that this is left unchecked or uh, nothing is done, okay? So first and foremost, with that amount of uh, pollution that they have on a daily basis or the amount of pollution that they're putting into the air, that type of pollution does not dissipate quickly, okay? And what I mean by that is when there is, <clears throat> excuse me, I rephrase. Um, there's only so much oxygen, right? There's only so much air to fill this space, right? With meaning like the layer of earth that requires oxygen, right? So if I continually pollute it, or if that area at least is continually pumped with air pollutants, um, it doesn't really have anywhere to go. <laughs> You'd have to do some serious damage or at least some serious good, I should say, to be able to get air pollution back to where it was. Uh, the other consequences of this is that transition is almost impossible when it's become this bad for so long. Like it said in the video, you really have to have everybody buy into this project for it to work and rural areas just rely too heavily on those standard methods and don't have enough money to transition to those other methods. And I'll reiterate it again, there's a population problem that is uh, refusing to cooperate with change. Another major consequence that they touched on in the video of um, air pollution being so rampant in India is that 2.79 million people suffer from tuberculosis or TB. Tuberculosis is basically a very, a really, really bad infection in the lungs or a bacterial infection in the lungs, excuse me, um, that causes your lungs to just basically eventually fail. And last but not least, another problem or another consequence that India is having of um, their air pollution being so bad is that um, India is basically letting politics stand in the way of getting things done. Many people have many different thoughts and many different um, opinions on what they should do with this uh, air pollution crisis. And it's literally hindering them from doing anything because they can't come to any solutions. So for now, they are taking some steps you know, up to 2021 or up to the date, they are taking some steps to go electric. They're taking steps so that industry can kind of slow down so that they're not emitting as much things into the air. But for right now, there have been no major steps uh, because government's uh, hindrance. Can I answer any questions for you about air pollution in India or air pollution in general? All right, are we ready to move on to water pollution? All right, so water pollution is the next step to this, okay? 
And again, water pollution, we're censoring it in India because India has the worst water pollution in the world. Over half of India's rivers are polluted based on the WHO and based on their different standards. There are different standards to water pollution based on the WHO. Some of them are, you know, there's a difference between having uh, a little bit of trash that had been thrown in a lake or a little bit of trash that had been filtered out through sewage versus having mountains upon mountains and turning the water black kind of pollution. Okay. But over half of India's rivers are in some way, shape or form on that spectrum. The two major rivers in India and basically the two major rivers for the entirety of the population of India is the Yamuna and the Ganges. And they are the two most polluted rivers in India and the world. So the Yamuna and the Ganges are basically life forces for the, uh, for the Indian people or for the population of India. 75% of the country uses those rivers and streams for daily life for things like food, either production, like agriculture, or just like, I need water to create this food, okay? Washing uh, themselves and laundry their clothes. And like I said, agriculture once again. And the most important part of that there is 75% of the country uses it for daily life, meaning 75% of the country needs those rivers to perform daily functions. So there is a high, high, uh, reliance on these rivers, regardless of how polluted they are. Okay. So outside of the rivers, right, that people use for daily life, um, there also is a groundwater resource that has been um, slowly being polluted throughout the years, okay? This graph basically shows more than 100 million people live in areas of poor water quality, and it's about groundwater quality. So everything in this uh, nice kind of pale yellow color um, is groundwater resources that have had no breaches, meaning groundwater resources that are basically fresh, that haven't been tainted or polluted by anything. But the uh, darker the color gets, uh, so like the orange, the red, the dark red, the darker the color gets, the more polluted or the more breaches there are to that groundwater, meaning that there is something happening before the people even get to the groundwater that is causing it to be polluted whether it be um, agricultural runoff, sewage waste, et cetera, et cetera, those areas have poor water quality on more than one instances because of these actions, basically, okay? And you may be thinking, well, that's a lot of light yellow, like that's at least good, right? That there's no breaches in those areas. <clears throat> but if you look, um, the places that have the breaches are the places where the most people live, and that's what the problem is, okay? So all of this area up here and kind of through this region in the north uh, eastern part of the country is where like New Delhi is and a lot of the other major cities, especially once you get down here to the coastal cities where there's a lot of agricultural happening. Okay, So, you know, it doesn't seem like a whole lot of breaches, but when uh, this entire area relies on this groundwater resource and it's a bad breach, it, that's not good. Okay. I'm going to show you guys another video about the Yamuna, about one of those rivers and how uh, awfully polluted it has been over the last couple of years. And again, some solutions that they've come up with, but mostly just what the problem is with the Yamuna being so polluted. Oh, God. Sorry. It 
and onto people's food and water supplies. Eventually, someone will be drinking this. More than 60 million people rely on the Yamuna for their water supply, including the residents of Patipachkai village in Agra. <coughs> it's a relatively wealthy community, but a few years ago, people just started getting sick. So this is the filter of the government. Yeah. Yes, yes. What was the problem with it? Oh, no, it is not working now. It asked for service in, uh, twice in our year, but since last five years, it is not serviced at all. Uh, not for a single time only. The water comes out of the ground. Yeah. It comes yeah. out of here, which is supposed to clean it. St stored into that uh, tank, and then it comes to that filter. But this thing doesn't clean anymore. No, no. Yeah, this is not clean anymore. So the water comes out of this. This, this, is, the, this is the only yeah. outlet for that now. Uh, filter one. But uh, now, as you know, it is a simple one, only a normal one. What happens to people who drink that water? Uh, people are having uh, many problems like pains in their um, uh, joints and uh, they are not able to uh, move, not able to walk uh, properly. And do the villagers know that the water they're drinking? Yeah, they know, but uh, there is no other option to uh, live. If they have to survive, then they will have to uh, drink the water. Nearby, in the city of Agra, local activist Bridge Carnival is fighting to rescue the river at its most famous point. When this building was constructed here, one of the major reasons was the river, which the Mughals thought was a much better river than the one in heaven because of the water quality. What did it look like back then? Oh, it was, uh, in fact, Bhavad himself had written the water of the river. It was uh, as good as nectar. But today, it's so scary. <laughs> The Uttarakhand High Court has ruled in a judgment that uh, both Siganga and Yamuna, the oldest of Indian rivers, they are living entities. And from the judgment also follows that the river has some basic human rights. How can human rights for a river really make really If it is a living entity, as the Uttarakhand High Court said, and every living entity has basic human rights. So the number of people killing this river must number in the millions. Everyone that openly deputates on its banks is in a small way responsible for its murder. That is true, but we have agencies which are supposed to regulate anti-social activities. Politics has so far failed to clean the Yamuna. In Agra, residents are looking elsewhere for help. One evening, they hold a prayer ceremony on the river bank to bless bricks they hope might one day be used in the barrage that would raise water levels in the city. We took the initiative of inviting everybody who was concerned with the river to the river bank and initiate action by doing havan and puja of the stones which we will place eventually when the foundation is laid by the government. <laughs> Action has to continue. We will go to the city of court. People who are responsible for the death of a river, they have to be punished. All right. So, oh, I mean, forgot that. Uh, so, that video, like I said, basically outlines 
Um, all of the things that the Yamuna River is used for and why it is so important to keep it preserved or why the people are trying to keep it preserved. But it also shows a lot of the reasons kind of like what we're have or what we're talking about. How is this happening and what are the consequences of it? Okay. So this video outlined a bunch of different things as to um, how the people use it, how people are trying to adapt to it, basically. So when we talk about our human environment interaction, that's part of the that's part of it, right? Is um, how do we adapt to it? How do we modify it? How do we change it? Okay. So the video talked a lot about that, but we got to come back to basically why is this happening? Why is the Yamuna? Why is water pollution in India? It's in Asia and all these places so, so bad. Okay. Uh, the number one reason is untreated sewage. Okay? Outside of just people literally throwing garbage into the river, um, and regardless of all the cleanup that may be happening, untreated sewage and a lack of water uh, filtration systems uh, is going to be the number one cause of pollution. Okay, eighty percent of untreated Indian sewage flows back into the river. Okay, so sewage is a variety of different things. It every time you flush the toilet, it's sewage. Okay, every time that uh, you run the dishwasher and all the dirty water goes down. That's sewage. Every time that you run the sink and all the dirty water goes down, it's sewage. Okay, eighty percent of that sewage in India comes back into the river or goes back into the river without being filtered, without being cleaned, without being sanitized. Which means that everything that you flush down the toilet or everything that goes through the dishwasher or everything that is a water source that runs back into the river ends up back into people's households. Okay, without being cleaned, without being filtered, without being sanitized. Another thing that's happening or another uh, reason that the water is so polluted is because there are multiple instances of agricultural runoff being a major problem in Indian territory. Agricultural runoff is what happens when you, you know, you've got a, a certain crop, you spray pesticides on it um, to make sure that no bugs eat it, but then you water it the next day and all of that water seeps into the ground or it runs off into a local stream that runs into the river and you're putting those chemicals back into the river. And those aren't the kind of chemicals we want to see in our water to keep it clean. It's the bad kind of chemicals. Okay? Along with that or kind of along the same lines, we have unregulated businesses or businesses who are engaging in basically dumping on a large scale that doesn't help out the river either. So for example, they used in the video um, that sari company, the, or the dyeing company that dyed all the saris, that they were taking the dye or the runoff from the dye uh, from cleaning the saris before they get shipped out, basically running directly back into the stream, which goes back into the or you know back into the river, which ends up in people's food. And then a current a concurrent theme that we saw throughout the entire video, and that you can still see when it comes to India's water health. Um, is unregulated government interaction, which can be thought of in basically two different ways. One, they don't have enough money to fund the things that need to happen. So they don't have enough money to uh, treat sewage. They don't have enough money to give people clean filtered water. But the second reason that we saw multiple times throughout this is that there's just straight up apathy. There's a lack of caring when it comes to people's water sources in India. Okay? So we could go service the water filter thing twice a year, but we just don't want to. Or we could stop people from literally shitting on the banks of the river, but we don't want to, okay? Or we can't. So all of these things are all of these things are happening concurrently to cause the water pollution to grow substantially out of control. I'm going to skip over this quote real quick. It's basically about, it's from an article called This is How You Kill a River. It's basically about all of these things that we just talked about here, the untreated sewage, the unregulated business, the uh, unwanted or the apathetic government interactions, kind of summed up into one paragraph or summed up into one quote. <clears throat> Excuse me. But we'll just go ahead and move straight to the consequences, okay? Last but not least. So what are the consequences of having poor water pollution or having poor water quality, okay? First and foremost um, is gonna be sickness and disease of various kinds, okay? When you have poor water quality or when you have uh, uh, high water pollution and water is something that is 75% of your daily life basically, 
uh, sickness, is, sickness and disease is almost inevitable. The top four sicknesses of the top four diseases that we see throughout India and throughout places with uh, low water quality are cholera, worms, typhoid, and dysentery. Typhoid and dysentery are both like types of fevers, basically types of infections that you can get from having dirty water. <clears throat> basically that there's, you know, all these bugs and all these bacteria that sit in the water when it's untreated or unfiltered. And then when you digest it, they go into your body. Same thing with worms, right? And then cholera is the number one. Cholera is something that you get or something that you basically specifically get um, from ingesting poop. That's how you get cholera. Because that sewage water is untreated and then you drink it the next day, not to be gross, but there's probably presence of poop in it, okay? That's why babies get cholera a lot, or like babies can sometimes get cholera because they'll poop and then they touch it and then put everything in their mouth and it makes them sick. That's how you get cholera. So the other consequences outside of sickness and disease, uh, there could be an economic downfall if the water doesn't get any better. So the economic downfall can lead to a decrease in food. And we kind of already know that process by talking about the water wars, right? That if we have no clean, access to water or we have limited amount of resources and access to water, agriculture will fall first because agriculture needs the most water, which will lead to a decrease in food, food, which could also lead to conflict, which leads to water wars, right? We've already, excuse me, kind of gone through that process over the last week or so, talking about the water wars. And it's the same kind of thing that could happen if the water is so polluted that we can't use it. So regardless of if we don't have it, if it's so polluted, we can't use it, the same thing will happen, okay? And then last but not least, one of the major consequences that we don't think about a whole lot is that acts of God, quote unquote, um, can make things a lot worse. So let's say that um, in India, uh, we've got the Yamuna and the Ganges that are so, so polluted to a certain point that no oxygen is in the water. Um, and then it becomes typhoon season. And all of that water is being basically lifted up out of the air, thrown onto the cities, used in basically the rain cycle. Um, it's going to take all that dirty, polluted water and put it literally back into the city. Okay. So these, quote, acts of God, like typhoons and hurricanes and kind of this rainy season that India goes through every year, flooding, et cetera, et cetera, is going to put that garbage directly back into the cities, which can make even more people sick. All right, so that is all I have for you today. If you finish that up, you can go ahead and put your notes away. Tomorrow, we are going to spend some time uh, talking about um, what air pollution and water pollution, uh, you know, continue talking about what it does and how it can be very detrimental to the environment in the long run. Um, and then we might have, we'll spend a little time or we'll probably spend a little time talking about our own pollution footprint and uh, what we can do closer to home.